Welcome everybody to the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group meeting, general meeting on April 27th. Uh, this is the first time I'm leading it. My name is Ray Dogum and I'm the new chair of the group. So I'm honored to be doing this and I'm very thankful for the group for selecting me. Um, we can probably first start off by just saying that this is a public forum, meaning that anything you say will be you know, shared, will be recorded and um, hosted publicly. So if you would like to read more about that, go to the Linux Foundation Antitrust Policy to read that. Um, yeah, and any questions on that? Okay, I think first thing I'd like to hear, if, just to make sure if there's any new people and they wanna introduce themselves to the group, uh, that would be fantastic. If you do wanna introduce yourself, feel free to unmute or raise your hand and we can call on you. Uh, this is a very, you know, open public group. So feel free to share what you know, who you are, um, and what you're looking to learn from this group. All right. Looks like everyone here has probably been here before. That's fine. Or don't want to share. That's also fine. Um, so Let's just jump right into the discussion for today. We have a few different uh, industry news articles that I pulled up from the couple of weeks prior to this. Um, but before we get into that, there is an upcoming, two upcoming events. One is actually happening today. It's the T-Mobile 5G and healthcare panel discussion webinar. I thought this was interesting because there's um, some discussion about blockchain that can happen uh, given that Dr. Pierre Vigilance, who's at Equitium Health, is going to be on the panel. So I just wanted to make you all aware of this event going on. And yeah, if you're interested in joining, there'll be a Q&A session. So that's one thing. And there is this Stanford event, the Science of Blockchain, happening August 29th. That was on the agenda from previous. So I just wanted to keep in there. All right. So... First up here is Microsoft has recently invested in Ethereum's um, consensus company. So anyone in here has probably heard of consensus before. So it's interesting to see that Microsoft is spending a huge amount of money investing in them uh, along with SoftBank and Temasek. So they're in total raising uh, $450 million, which I thought was pretty significant uh, given you know, the valuation of consensus now is doubled to $7 billion. Uh, has anyone seen this, taken a look at this? I thought it was pretty a pretty big deal for the industry overall. Yeah, I took a look at it. How does this affect uh, consensus health? Or is it still that well, way? Yeah, I wouldn't say it affects... Uh, that's a good question. So I don't think it directly would it impact Equitium Health. So Equitium Health is right. a company of consensus health for anyone who didn't know. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, or not that I am aware of, but I did think that this chart was pretty interesting. Just in general, the amount of funding that's going to blockchain startups, um, so it says soared eightfold in 2021. So that's a pretty big deal from my perspective, uh, yeah, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I, it's, that's a huge increase, it's crazy. I know that like I'm part of a DAO that funds a lot of blockchain startups and I don't know if it's related to just like the DAO, all the DAOs coming up and raising funds and distributing them to different startups. Yeah, I think that they will probably be doing that. Um, they, one thing I did see in this article is they are converting all the money that they raised into Ether. Uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Mm. That's a big bet. Of course I do. That's like Joe's net worth is Ether. <laughs> so like, yeah. that, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, what I was always curious about is like, where's the money going? Is it going towards more the institutional side of the business? Is it going more towards the developer side of the business? Um, you assume like, so they have this MetaMask institutional uh, offering, but is that institutional offering, like for the most part, I'm not sure if like 
MetaMask Institutional has the actual tools and plugins to make that valuable, or is it BitGo and Cactus Custody on the back end that is actually making that like uh, the real valuable tool for institutions to like get into proof of stake networks and other things like that? That's a question I truly have. Yeah, not entirely sure. That's a good question. I don't know if anyone in here has any insight into that, but it does look like the funds will go into hiring 600 more employees. Um, and they're going to be redesigning MetaMask later this year. So watch out for that too. What could they redesign? I guess they would just be focused on the institutional side because like the user and the consumer angle of MetaMask is, I mean, it's, it's not perfect, but it's probably the most successful on the market. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there is some design changes they can make to make it more friendly to new users. You know, I feel like if I didn't know how to navigate the web, you know, blockchain world, um, I, feel, I, you know, I feel like I'm risking something every time I'm signing a transaction, like I'm not sure if I'm doing this right. So maybe just more educational material walkthroughs with MetaMask might be what they're doing, but we can find out maybe later this year about that. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next article actually. I thought this was pretty interesting too. It was published in Scientific American and a few other places as well, uh, basically promoting this idea to uh, endorse NFTs for um, basically health data and medical ethicists are endorsing it. So I don't know if anyone took a look at this one. I didn't read through all of it, but it was pretty interesting from what I saw. There's a a full journal paper published in JMIR Bioinformatics and Biotechnology, um, where you know they talk about NFT technology and how it could have avoided the problem highlighted by the Henrietta Lacks story, which we may have all may already all know about. Um, so yeah, just I thought it was interesting because it talks about the medical ethical issues around health. I actually don't, I don't know about that story personally. Could you give like maybe 15 seconds of that? Yeah, sure. So back, I think, yeah, this is 1951. There was an African-American woman who had cervical cancer and her cells were harvested actually by doctors or researchers there at the time without her knowledge. She wasn't aware of it. Her family wasn't aware of it. And those cells, they call them HeLa cells now. And they've been copied, reproduced, and used for research, you know, for decades now. So, um, because the so-called HeLa cells were able to survive and thrive in the lab, they became essential to a wide range of medical research. Henrietta Lacks, her family were never given any, uh, you know, reimbursement or funding or any sort of even acknowledgement that they were doing this. There's actually a movie about it. There's like a documentary movie. Uh, I forgot what it's called, but I, I did watch it. It was pretty good. I don't know. It was Oprah Winfrey might have been on it. Don't quote me on that. So something to check out. Thought it was pretty interesting. And it just kind of validates this idea that NFTs do have the potential to bring health data back to the patient and allow them to own it in a way that we couldn't before. So. I think today, and I want to shut up because I want other people to, to give their thought, but I think today NFTs and the whole um, ownership and uh, distribution of them is is a highly taxable event. Uh, uh, and like one, to mint an NFT to your origination is a taxable event. Then every time you distribute it either on a marketplace or to another user, that is viewed as a taxable event. So unless like, unless the user and the, the NFT is in distributed for a very high and large amount. Uh, it probably wouldn't be worth it for most people to create an NFT because then it, it, like it wouldn't be worth like the, the hassle and the, the taxable like write-ups you have to be able to, to follow in order to stay compliant. And everyone in healthcare wants to stay compliant. So like I think for, and I've, I've said this many times on this, this gathering that like, unless you're dealing with like superstar athletes or you're dealing with chronically ill patients, um, you know, like the extremes of the bell curve of what data actually, health data actually matters to people. I'm not sure if like creating NFT is really worth it unless someone just is really like a, a data ownership advocate 
and like really wants to be able to be ahead of that. I think those are kind of the, the maxims and the motivations. Um, but I also think like the, what molecule and the IP NFT group of like distributing the access of the NFT, when you pull people together to then, if that NFT is very beneficial to a specific uh, subset of medical data or therapeutic, that's where it gets a little bit more interesting. Yeah, and I agree with you. The idea that every transaction, NFT or cryptocurrency is taxable as a taxable event, that is a huge barrier for entry. But you could imagine some countries or some territories who don't have those um, laws or regulations, and maybe it's more open. Would it be more, would you be more inclined to use it if you were living in one of those countries, for example? Yeah. You know, well, was- it's the taxable stuff too, but then also the minting and the gas process too, if you're trying to do it in a full decentralized way. Otherwise, if you do it in more the centralized way, then the centralized company kind of like can dictate the price and the cost and the percentage of ownership of that NFT a little bit more. So you get less of a financial benefit too. Uh, like in a lot of, catch- like in Africa in particular, they're creating NFTs to own different digital assets of yourself, right? Um, not medical data as much, but there is research going on in that, that field. But it's the centralized companies that are creating the platform and the service for that, that are taking the burden of the fee, but then also taking a higher percentage of the ownership of it. Um, and part of that thinking was actually in uh, Meta's like idea of like why they want to charge so much for digital assets in the metaverse. Like, I don't know if anyone saw that, but they're charging like 47% of a fee to yeah. take if you were like selling things in this. And part of that was because of the thinking of NFTs and taxable events and, and all things like that, that it wouldn't be worth it for them to be able to create these artifacts and these assets unless it was that high of a fee due to the risk and other compliance they would need to adhere to. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think the, decentraliz- the decentralization of it is important, but also you could imagine in the future a side chain or some sort of you know second layer um, where the costs, the fees are really minimal and it doesn't cost too much to mint the NFT or share it or move it around. So I think we'll have to see how um, this evolves. But yeah, I think those are really good points. Anybody else have any comments? Or Hi, uh, mm-hmm. Hi, Ray, Mike. Um, sorry, uh, apologies, but I'm, I'm traveling at the moment, so I'm not going to turn my camera on. But one thing I'm thinking about is what what kind of medical data are you talking about data generated by personalized devices or are you talking about medical notes and like what is the practical implication to like providing or making a medical uh like uh notes like how how are you going to do it day to day like doctors are already already overloaded um is the system that we capture the data in is is that the nft or is it just going to be a photocopy of, of the patient's notes um, as, a, as, a, as a JPEG on OpenSea? So, like, I think the idea is there, but I just think the, the practical implications of actually doing it with a face-to-face interaction with the patient is, is somewhat limited. I think we're quite far away from that, personally. Yeah, that's also a good question. Like, what discrete elements do we consider the NFT? Is it the entire uh, medical record as one NFT, or would it be each specific field considered like your blood pressure is in a separate NFT. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I think here, you know, in this article, they're sort of, sort of saying uh, medical researchers and companies are purchasing large anonymized data sets to find novel markers of disease, train diagnostic algorithms, and create risk calculators. Um, let's see how that. Imp- yeah, one of the values. I mean, that- I- Go ahead. No, no, I'm just thinking out loud. I said one of maybe one of the ways to do it with the ICD classification. So then you classify your NFT according to your disease state. But that's uh, maybe a, a distant thought. But yeah, that, that's uh, that's just a thought. Sorry, crack on my. Yeah, so I think uh, just to weigh in, um, you know, my concern is more about the uh, copyright or the legal um, consent. Uh, so my own experience, either at Vanderbilt or outside of Chicago is um, the uh, consent to treat also includes the consent to do research. Uh, and that research is totally owned by the health core organization. And in fact, there's specific clauses that state that the patient can't own nor um, it has no right to any information gleaned from the derived data. 
So I think it's an uphill battle as far as like, I think the technology of minting an NFT that represents some aspect of the data or a derived algorithm or um, approach to the data, uh, new insights, I guess, is I think it's more of a legal question. I think the notes uh, is very clearly uh, shared with the patient, but it's owned by the, the copyrighted by the provider who wrote them, um, is my understanding of, of legal aspects. Not to mention med medical notes um, are messy. They're, they're it's natural language, it's medical language, it's hard to parse. And I don't think we have a really good mechanism to understand natural language. So there's a lot of processing of it for extracting tokens and concepts, but not the usefulness of that. It, and remember, I also have to remember that the purpose of the medical note is for Johnny, for the physician to have a place to jot down their ideas and to remind themselves what's going on, number one. Number two is share those thoughts with other providers. And then it's an ex, really an excuse not to pay providers when they haven't documented enough. Like that's the purpose of, of documentation. Or, and you could say that that's more justification for reimbursement, but my flip side of that is, my, in my own experience, is it's an excuse not to pay the doctor when you haven't documented it enough. And so I think, uh, so I don't know if the medical notes per se is gonna be uh, helpful. Now, I think also to point out the, what happened with Henrietta Lacks could happen today. And so there's nothing preventing like medical, if you look at some of the legal jargon, in um, the consent to treat, and I know I was on the IRB when I was at Vanderbilt, and there's a whole bunch of controversy of, you assume that the, the first clause of the consent to treat is that, you know, we are an academic medical center doing research and we have the right to use your leftover blood and genomic information to put into our synthetic derivative of our databases to do research. It's really hard to actually have an opt-out model like that, um, to uh, enable patients. So you can imagine Henry Lacks, which is like it's leftover blood or sampling that um, was immortal, Im immortalized. And um, the, the, the legal jargon right now is my understanding is that it doesn't prevent that from happening today. Great points, yeah. Anybody else have comments to share on this one? All right, thanks for that discussion, everybody. Next here is an article about Coinbase launching their NFT marketplace. Uh, you know, we all might have heard of OpenSea and others, but uh, it's interesting to see Coinbase launching theirs. Not frankly surprised, but it is something to be aware of. Coinbase is one of the largest exchanges for crypto. And now that they're in NFTs for policy, uh, another huge uptick in, in the marketplace. Uh, not too much to discuss here. Just wanted to mention it as an important thing. I don't think they're selling medical NFTs at all. It's probably just still images and collections, uh, but who knows? And they have had uh, less than um, ideal numbers when it comes to uh, activity on this marketplace. It, is, it has been very quiet, I would say, on the Coinbase NFT marketplace. Yeah. All right, uh, this other article here, the next one, 22% NFT art projects. So I was actually, I don't know how I first found these guys, but it was, it's a project run somewhere in Europe. It's a, a university project. And what they're doing is trying to, they've already created a collection of NFT art based on the prevalence of different diseases globally. So each, NFT is an image you can see here, and they're randomized in terms of which diseases the individual has. So this person you can see has, I guess, diabetes type two. Uh, one, each individual NFT can have up to six different diseases, so comorbidities, and the prevalence in the NFT collection is, matches the prevalence in the real world, which I thought was pretty interesting. The purpose of this project is to raise awareness of different types of diseases around um, you know, the world. And they are planning to donate some of it to charity as well. So I um, thought it was interesting. I don't know if anyone- The giving block, the giving block put this together? 
Uh, it looks like they're referencing the giving block. So we want to donate to organizations that help people, giving them new perspectives in a transparent way, using platforms such as the giving block as much as possible and making our donation transaction ID public. I did invite their group. I'm on their Discord channel. I don't know if there's anybody in here specifically that's would like to talk about the group, about the project. Yes, right. Actually, I'm here. Sorry, I'm in the gym, and therefore it's a bit. Uh, <laughs> no problem. I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you. Do you want to give uh, kind of a brief overview of any updates you have on the project? Maybe how many NFTs you've sold so far? What, what's your plan? Sure, right sure. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, as mentioned, uh, the goal of uh, or the vision of the, the project is really to create awareness especially in the NFT space where there are a lot of data that are not real. And therefore, we want to really to put some real data into the space by creating a, a collection. And therefore, we choose finally 60, more than 60 diseases. And based on the prevalence of those diseases, these were put uh, in a random way mm, into the into the, the collection. And uh, it was quite tough, actually, we launched on Ethereum in, in the beginning of the year. We, uh, we struggled a little bit with marketing and maybe you know better than me, but uh, marketing is uh, really a tough thing in the NFT space. And therefore we sold the maybe 40 NFTs and uh, we try to relaunch uh, now also on Solana. And now we sold uh, maybe 15 NFTs uh, out of uh, 10,000. Therefore, um, it was uh, yeah, a success because uh, we were able to, um, to put this uh, on place and uh, put everything together so that we could have uh, um, a collection. But uh, finally, we didn't sell everything but we are planning to, to do more a community-driven um, project out of this. And therefore, our next step uh, will be, um, we will go in the direction, if you are part of the community and you are active in the community, you will receive NFTs. Uh, and with those NFTs, you can make a change because you are creating awareness, exactly. And as you mentioned, we are donating or we donated uh, already um, through giving blocks on the first page. You, you, you see it, um, also the transaction that we did with, uh, with the different projects. If you go a bit further down to the organization that we donated, there are those links where we did it. Uh, I see that. And therefore, that's uh, about our project. And uh, I'm really thankful that you gave us this opportunity to be part of this. And uh, actually, it sounds really interesting what you are discussing here. Awesome. Raphael, thanks for joining us from the gym and sharing um, more about 22% project. Thank you. Raphael, Thank you. health is wealth, man. That's awesome. You're getting in the gym while we'll take a call. I do it all the time too. Uh, quick question <laughs> though. Um, yeah. Quick question. How much, like, obviously giving blocks a for profit entity, whereas like someone like endowments, a non for profit entity, like, how much of the actual total ghost, like, how much do you as a, a operator at giving block have to take uh, of the total to then give it to the actual uh, organization? So actually, basically, um, we don't know exactly how much a giving block is taking away from what we are donating. But we, what we donate uh, is uh, at the beginning was 22% of what uh, the sale was. Uh, this because we wanted really with the other, um, other percentage of money, we wanted really to uh, grow the project and to evolve it by do a breeding collection or something like this. But actually, um, yeah, we, we didn't sell out so far, 
but we still believe in the project. Now we, we took a little break, but uh, actually we think by driving out, uh, by involving more the community, and uh, now it's also not a really good time for NFTs in general, uh, we think that we can um, anyway reach our goal to, to create awareness. But what we did or what we do is that every three months, uh, this percentage is increasing. Therefore, now we are already donating 24, almost 25% of what the income is, uh, and then up to 99% of, of the income and all the royalties on the different platforms and things like this. Awesome. Thanks, Raphael. And I, I actually have one of the NFTs. I'm using uh, the image as my Twitter profile picture. So I think it's pretty cool. And I like supporting this project myself. Any other comments, questions on this project? Okay. Thanks, Raphael. I do like, I love the project. This is great. Like, and I don't want to take away from like the, the great, like the good that you guys are doing as a group, but does any of this become like, like, and maybe I'm, I'm speaking out of turn here on this, but like, is any of this like HIPAA identifiable information that like, but someone's consenting obviously to have this like viewable, right? Like are there concerns or things that you've had to think about when it comes to like too much medically identifiable information on these IDs? So uh, actually, I didn't fully understand the question. Uh, so so a lot I of time, can... yeah, go ahead, right? I was going to say, so Mike's asking if it, there's any regulatory issues with um, patient data being shared. But really, Mike, these images, you know, any any person can buy any of the images. So they don't have, if they have, you know, uh, skin cancer, they don't have to buy an NFT with skin cancer. They can buy any of them. So there's no, I don't know where the, risk would be for compliance but what were you thinking okay. actually it, it, it's a good question it's something that i thought also about it also to use the information about uh, vho and uh, but finally it's the purpose is not to make money but it's really to to create awareness and uh, if they share the data and we share the data um I don't think it's a big issue. And if people are buying those NFTs uh, um, with uh, a specific uh, diseases, it's uh, up to them. But uh, I don't know, maybe in the US, uh, there are some specific regulation that I, I was not aware of, or we were not aware. Did I answer your question, Mike? And here I'm just showing the OpenSea one of the listings, you can see the different um, diseases this person has, tuberculosis, myopa, and it tells you how many, what percentage of the NFTs have this trait. So 23% of these, the NFT collection has tuberculosis and that corresponds in prevalence, I believe to the- um, Yeah, actually, actually here I have, <laughs> the problem is that uh, not the whole collection was minted. And therefore, the information there, it's not yet 100% uh, okay. uh, um, correct, let's say like this. Got yeah, it. you guys both uh, definitely got as close to my question as possible. I think it's still a gray area in the space, so we're all trying to think about it as well. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Next here, putting the me in the healthcare metaverse. I thought this was pretty interesting post by Eberhard Shore. He's actually the president of the DHealth Foundation, um, which is a blockchain health app, health company. And they're working on many things, including identity um, and being able to really monetize people's or patients' data as well. So very similar to what a lot of companies are doing in this space. Um, but a couple of things that just thought were interesting. He identifies some specific, um, to put the digital twins data to work, there are some prerequisites for the me to be part of this medical dataverse. He talks about identity as being one of them. First, our digital twin means an identity that is connected to reality. And I feel like that's 
a huge challenge for us right now as an industry, as a group. Uh, in the real world, a patient identifier is essential because it allows matching treatments and health status to a person. Uh, saying that blockchain technology can take privacy to the next level from a private key that is usually connected to a wallet, an endless number of sub-identities can be derived in a deterministic way. Uh, the reality of me in today's health system is that data points are pretty unconnected, as we can all agree. Oh, I see Jim Sinclair has his hand up. Hey, Jim. Hey, good morning. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't had a chance to read this, but since I saw you scrolling through it about digital twins, I would just go ahead and share with the group that Linux Foundation Public Health is doing a press release with the Digital Twin Consortium, which is part of the object management group. Probably this week or next, we're launching a joint initiative. We're also bringing on the University of Miami Medical Center as a um, as a member um, specifically on, on digital twin technology. And we'll be establishing a, a healthcare digital twin center of excellence at LFPH. Uh, which will include consideration of, of differential privacy and federated learning and uh, decentralized identity too. Awesome. Yeah. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, so looking here, so another part of this article is about users, user controlled data repository. So to control the data representing me, I need to have decentralized, a decentralized repository to store my digital twins data. Unfortunately, the healthcare industry tends to store data in a centralized way. Maybe that has its historical roots. Traditionally, healthcare is organized medical centers. Oh, I did see this quote, which I thought was pretty interesting. The sentiment in the healthcare IT industry that is responsible for storing data, medical data becomes apparent when we look at an exchange in 2017 at a meeting of cancer moonshot. Joe Biden, who had lost a son to a brain tumor, told the CEO of Epic Systems um, that patients should access should have access to their medical records. And then the CEO of Epic, Judy Faulkner, replied, why do you want your medical records? There are thousands, there are a thousand pages of which you understand 10. So I didn't look to verify this quote, but I thought it was interesting. Um, that she would say that only like, I guess five years. Yeah, and, uh, and the rest of the story is that Biden responded, well, I want to print it off and wallpaper my walls with it. doesn't matter. It's, 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 no, it's about me. And I think it just gets to my point as far as like, well, who really does own the, that, that document? I know it's a, about the patient, but it's in an EHR system. And it's just the whole challenge with implementing the 21st Century Cures Act is, um, is how to really implement this and where the patient is in, in control. I think, um, you know, uh, I think peer vigilance uh, talked a few weeks, maybe a month ago, um, talking about how to flip the script on consent and with this idea of a consent receipt. And it's, not, it's also about um, explicitly opting in rather than this opt out model. And so for example, in the, the consent um, for use of information in your EHR or leftover blood. Uh, and that's what like the Henry and Alack story is that nothing prevents that from happening today. It's now explicitly um, conditioned in your consent to treat that they're allowed to use your, your blood and leftover sampling explicitly now, and you've give, given up that control. But if you flip the script where the, the consent is now um, given from the patient and, and allowed for the healthcare system, then you've now changed the dynamics where uh, I, I'm now a, a, a shopper of healthcare where they respect my privacy and I have options. And I think the challenge just in our healthcare system, at least in the United States, is that a lot of people just don't have options. They go to the closest place that actually has care and they're willing to give up the privacy and, and or control over their information in hopes of just, you know, of, of getting their care and, um, and get, getting their healthcare. Yeah, it's a good point, Jonathan. And I mean, I know we, we can't seem to have a meeting where we don't discuss, you know, patient ownership of data, consent, and that sort of thing. And I, I like to consistently bring up all of these things are governed by state laws. We have 50 states that we have to sort through. I'm, I'm working as part of a consent utility project now 
in um, with the Bronx Regional Health Information Organization around sharing like welfare agency data and child uh, child welfare agency data and the like as part of social services, which also fits into like the HL7 Gravity Project. And the challenge is what the state of New York laws are for consent and what consent, uh, no, what degree or notice of informed consent you can have um, is different than it is in New Jersey, which is different than it is in every other state. And in fact, on the issue of renewing consent with that, with that opt-in, opt-out model came up in discussion yesterday. You know, Bronx Rio said, I don't even want to do it more than once a year. Um, I don't want, you know, you know, conditional consent models. I can't, I can't deal with that burden and the individual can't either. California is opt-in by default, unless you specify, surprisingly enough, in health information exchange. So, you know, we, we talk about, hey, patients want to control this and, hey, we should give consent. We, we need this to be an issue at the state legislature level first, and we need you know, coordinated efforts to do that on a national basis. And organizations like Epic and the ACLU aren't helping any. And I'll stop ranting. You make a good point. I think, you know, each state does have different laws. And if you, even if you move from one state to the other, now you have to reconcile how your data is being managed too. So it's pretty confusing. And I think just the, the last point on that too, is the quote from Judy Faulkner was that um, Epic isn't, the, the focal point of data blocking, it's the healthcare systems that want to block to prevent um, competition. So it's like if you have a healthcare organizations in, let's say, Nashville, and there's seven of them, they wanted to make it difficult for you to go across the street. Epic is has care everywhere. So they're just selling EHR systems. They're not necessarily the focal point of um, healthcare data blocking um, it, it, and just understanding the dynamic there. That's absolutely the case. And, and, as a, and as somebody from a company that worked with Epic for a year around decentralized identity, if customers don't ask for it, Epic doesn't sell it. So, you know, we can come up with all these great ideas we want. If a healthcare system isn't interested in enabling, you know, decentralized identity, user consent, et cetera, et cetera, then it doesn't happen. Yeah, all good points. Um, I'm going to move on just because we do have a few more here. That I want to cover. So the next article is on. Uh, it's just about A16Z forms a crypto research and coding unit to help Web3 startups. So just another indication that the you know space is growing. Um, I think they were raising. Well, if you don't know already, Andreessen Hor Horowitz has grown into one of the largest investors in crypto, ranking. Uh, $2.2 billion for its third crypto fund last summer. So that's pretty big. Uh, yeah, this is a pretty short article on Coindesk. Yeah, they're excited to announce the creation of their A16Z crypto research group, a new kind of multidisciplinary lab that will work closely with our portfolio and others towards solving the important problems in the space and toward advancing the science and technology of the next generation of the internet. So the VC is screaming at Web3. Um, not a bad thing, but that's what's happening in this case, I think. Any comments? All right, and it looks like we got some red in here in the markets today, Bitcoin down, Ethereum down too. Next. Uh, my list is this article from MIT Technology Review that I thought was pretty interesting in that it kind of explains why maybe the crypto revolution um, might not be for everybody. So um, recommend this to anyone who likes this sort of devil's advocate perspective, but they do say that there are some value, there is value in it as well. It's not all negative. Um, and the reason I thought it was, I wanted to bring it up is they do mention MediLedger in the article itself. So here I'm skipping a little bit, but the most, the most industry transforming use case so far, although perhaps the one with the least sizzle, meaning that it's not a very sexy use case, uh, might be the MediLedger Medi network and its custodian organization, Chronicle. So if you don't know already, MediLedger is working to improve the uh, drug supply chain and 
you know, they're doing a pretty good job from what I'm seeing. Uh, they're growing. The CEO is Suzanne Somerville. And it is a private blockchain, however. So that is something to consider. It's closed permission. Uh, but yeah, I think there are pharma companies interested in this sort of model. They're experimenting, experimenting with it, but some of it is actually in production as well. So I don't know if anybody has anything to add to this one. They also talk about Ripple a lot in here, so that's interesting. Okay. So those were the articles I had in terms of news and projects. There are some uh, five other articles related to like educational nuggets here, so more technical, uh, but I think definitely worth a read. The first one here is about z uh, zero knowledge proofs. Uh, and, you know, this is by A16Z. They published this, goes into the history of zero knowledge proofs. Um, and it also talks about Planck's. So Planck is, in case you all don't know, the first big breakthrough was that Planck only requires a single universal trusted setup. The initial ceremony in which a common reference string used by provers and verifiers for a given zero knowledge proof system is performed. Yeah, so there's a lot of detailed technical information here that some of you might be interested in. I don't know if any of you had the chance to look into it more, but good background to know. Uh, the next one I had here for educational nuggets was related to Ethereum's centralization dilemma. So uh, there is talk in the space about Ethereum staking being getting centralized. So there is this conversation in the space about how are we going to make uh, ETH staking more decentralized. Um, so Lido is one of the one of the uh, most um, used staking Actually, services. Could you try again? Okay. So here you can see this graph showing the percentage of staking. Um, or I'm the, not sure I understand. Hmm. I think something is detecting my voice and playing it, but I uh, apologize for that. So here you can see Lido in the orange basically dominating. It's got the most staking balance. So this is a concern for Ethereum's, for some people. Um, anyone have any comments on this? I was just going to comment on the fact you had problems with your robot overlords, but uh... Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, Apologize for that. <laughs> yeah, it looks like Lido leads liquid staking with 25% of ETH2 deposits. You can see here some details as well. And then the next article actually also related to that is about Lido's roadmap for decentralization. So this was published April 14th. And you know, we all know the Ethereum merge is approaching sometime in the summer, I think is the target for that. Um, and they are you know, talking about different ways to make sure that they are decentralized and they're um, a good validator. Really good stuff in here if you're interested in the technical aspect of staking and Ethereum's decentralization. Uh, the next thing here is just actually um, the last podcast episode I published with Everardo Barajas. He's the CEO for Scripto, focused in Latin America, and he's been working for a number of years on digitizing prescriptions using blockchain. So it's interesting that he, his company is using RexChain uh, as their blockchain protocol or consensus mechanism. So um, I'm not too familiar with RexChain, but I just thought it was interesting and wanted to mention it. Um, and it's something that you guys can listen to in detail if you're interested, especially if you are from, you know, 
Mexico or Latin America, which is where they're focused. All right, so actually the last item here I had was another A16Z article um, by Jocelyn Pearl about, it's a guide to decentralized biotech. So this is sort of like an overview of biotech and how it, you know, how some of these companies are trying to make it more decentralized. Um, so we'll talk about Science Exchange, its platform launched in 2011, has greatly improved access to and usage of CROs. Through its marketplace, companies can source, order, and pay for scientific services from more than 3,500 providers, while also reducing the lift, the contract lift normally required. And then it does mention LabDAO, which you may have heard is a, uh, we might have talked about it earlier or, or something to that effect, or a similar company rather. Uh, LabDAO is another company working to fill the research access gap. It's building a marketplace where smaller startups and academic researchers can find micro CROs uh, or con contract research on a smaller scale to provide services such as bioinformatics analysis, automated cloning, and construct design. She admits we're still a long way off from having something like an AWS for biotech, which would be really awesome, I think, um, and you know, feasible, I, I think. Uh, but platforms like Science Exchange and LabDAO are gradually improving access to contract-based research. She goes into talking about empowering people and talent talks about the decentralized science movement and how tech VCs have ramped up their investments in biotech, especially in startups with younger or less conventional founders. Yeah, so there's definitely an increased interest in investing in these smaller companies. Um, do we all think that will increase? Let me pose a question to the group. Do we think that the level of investment in riskier biotech startups will continue to increase or will there be some sort of you know drawback or or slow down yeah nobody knows um so the few companies listed here i think this is Pretty good content if you're interested in, you know, decentralized science, biotech. It's a good article, I thought. So, wanted to make sure everyone get a chance to look at this. You know, she talks specifically about DAO-funded projects, including Molecule, which I do believe we mentioned today, um, and yeah, by the DAO as well. I've heard of Vital Dow and I've heard of Molecule. I don't know the current status of what what they're working on, but it's another good one where you know there's a there's a huge regulatory framework around clinical trials in the first place, as well as IP law concerning molecules and how to do it. So it's a it's ripe for decentralization. Yeah, there is still a lot of you know regulatory um, tape they need to like work through. I'm gonna read here, a major draw of biotech DAOs like VitaDAO is how quickly they can get work done. In the 10 months since its launch, VitaDAO has evaluated over 60 research proposals, proposals and financed almost $2 million worth of research across 10 projects. That's like taking an NIH research project grant, which normally gives one lab $250,000 a year for five years, and splitting the money across projects at 60 labs. Um, another advantage is that DAOs don't have the same hiring restrictions as traditional biotech companies. That is true. Uh, this means people with diverse experiences at different stages in their careers can get involved with a DAO or several if they want, since there's no expectation of exclusivity. The benefits of employment differ from those of a traditional day job. You might be paid in tokens or Ethereum or even just gratitude. 
uh, versus receiving a salary in US dollars. But for those who have the time working for a biotech DAO offers a playground for scientific input, teamwork and innovation, and even a place to learn new skills like content and marketing. Hmm, interesting. So I do think that most of the research that are you know, using these types of DAOs are uh, like younger researchers. Maybe they aren't able to get traditional grants and this is one way they think they could get some funding and, and they you know, go for it. So um, I think we'll be seeing more of these types of organizations in the future. Thanks so much for sharing this, Ray. I haven't had a chance to take a look at it yet, but um, I'm gonna look at it after the meeting. It looks interesting. Awesome. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to do it. Um, and that was the last article that I pulled from the last couple of weeks. Is there anything people wanted to share with the group here that we didn't talk about yet, or maybe something we missed in the last few weeks that you wanna share? Open to discussion. Okay, well, in that case, we can probably give everyone a few minutes back of their day. I think this was a great meeting, great discussion. Thank you all for your inputs um, and feedback. And again, the agenda and the links to all the articles are available in the Hyperledger Confluence space. So feel free to reach out. Um, reach out to me if you can't find it and or you could just probably Google it and find it. So again, there is a event later today T-Mobile 5G and healthcare panel discussion webinar. Um, that might be interesting to y'all. So yeah, really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to, oh, actually, um, we, Eric and I were discussing earlier this week about the next meeting and we might both not be able to uh, make it. So the next meeting in two weeks might be canceled. So we might reconvene in a month, um, but look out for an email from me just to confirm that. And um, yeah, just wanted to let you all know about that. So Turn your hands meeting. up. Say again. Is your hand still up? Yeah, I see Jim's hand is still up. I don't know if that was from before. No, it was an accident. They should they should time out after a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No worries. All right. Well, again, thanks yeah. everybody. Appreciate it, and we will look forward to next time. Great job, Ray. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Take care. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.